This place sure is crawling with celebrities. I'm the only person here I never heard of. <laughs> Hello, Labcasters. So excited about tonight. Um, but I got to confess, I fell asleep before the recording. My my <laughs> my desk in my recording gear is right next to my bed. And I just thought, you know, I'm just going to lay down for a sec uh, before and get, gather my thoughts before this epic episode tonight. Because we had a special guest, Frank Tomzik, and a special guest, Tommy Truong, who's with me right now, um, and he was there last night for the recording. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm about to. Um, but you were there, Tommy. Yes, yes, indeed it was. was that, and it was just so awesome being able to hear Frank and Angela and Ben talk. They're, they are so smart, awesome people. And it was an amazing opportunity just to listen to them speak as well as converse with them and just share knowledge and innovation. Well, I am so excited to check it out and to listen to it with you, our listeners. And um, I'm excited that, Tommy, I think you're going to be able to join us for a lot more future episodes, too. So I'm excited about that. So here it is, a conversation with Frank, Ben, Angela, and Tommy. Mesdames et messieurs... And we Bonjour. are live from France. <laughs> Comment ça va? That's all I got. I, I was like, I don't have, I don't have enough of the French skills, and and one of our guests tonight could certainly prompt them out of me. Um, but I don't have enough of the French skills to be eloquent enough to properly kick off this podcast tonight. And I just want to say that I am jazzed that for our first foray with true guests that we have not one but two guests here here and we have a guest host tonight in one of those positions as well so mixing it all up we're we're innovating the face off <laughs> of this podcast my face is is gone now due to innovation <laughs> not due to microdermabrasion which i know many of you guys thought but actual pure and honest innovation. So um, I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves. And then I am going to share a little bit about what we're going to do tonight and then turn it over to my co-host. So we'll go down the list of, I hope that our names are all in order for everybody on Zencaster, but I am Dame mm. Maggie Smith recording live from France. And actually, no, I'm Angela Gunder, and I am Senior Instructional Designer for the Office of Digital Learning. Well, I'm Ben Scragg. I'm the Program Manager for College Ready Ohio at K-12 Higher Ed Consortium Grant at The Ohio State University. All right. Hello. Uh, I'm Tommy. I am a learning experience designer at Michigan State University's Hub for Innovation in Learning and Technology, and also an undergraduate at Michigan State studying experience architecture. Holy shit. I'm so excited to dig into all of that. And awesome. then <laughs> and then Frank. Um, last but not least, right? Uh, I'm Frank Tomsik. I'm the director of the McCormick Educational Technology Center at Rush University here in Chicago. So uh, two sort of synergistically awesome things happened to make up all that is tonight. Um, and you'll notice for you frequent listeners that Dave Goodrich is not with us. We're hoping that he's going to pop in a little bit later. But um, one of the two things that happened uh, was that Dave reached out to Tommy and um, asked him if he would like to join us on this Innovation Lab cast. As we've talked about in the past, innovation takes many forms, and one of those uh, forms that we've been really exploring, or I've been saying plumbing a whole lot, which sounds like Mario Brothers, but um, also awesome, um, is this sort of organic, open collaboration with all sorts of thought leaders and stakeholders that are around us and are in our social spheres. And um, Tommy has been one of those individuals for Dave, and um, Dave wanted to share his brilliance with us. So that's why he is joining us tonight. And um, separately uh, from that, 
Frank Tomsick happens to be one of our thought leaders as well um, for Ben, Dave, and I. And um, in a conversation that was a really a, a professional development collaboration, we actually have a research group um, that meets every week where we talk about an exploratory installation that we all um join up around called the Technology Test Kitchen. In that research group, um, Frank and I, with another one of our colleagues, Clark Shaw Nelson, ended up talking about this podcast and um, all of the compelling conversations that we end up having around the, the ideas and the questions that we launch out there. And Frank has long been um, a favorite human being of mine because he is relentless in terms of his quest for truth and knowledge. And he is just a maverick of getting us to think about all of the things that are messy, but need to be thought about and, and helps us to unpack all of those big ideas. So I asked him if he would like to join us tonight and, um, really, um, have us, have us answer anything that he thought to be worthy because every conversation I have with Frank, um, I always, um, end it with wanting to like high five myself and everyone around me. <laughs> I'm just like inspired and jazzed and, and fired up and all that good shit. So, um, that's what we're doing tonight and I'm going to leave it up to Frank to sort of guide where this goes. And, um, Tommy, since you're new to this, if you have questions, you're, it's not just you on the, on the hot seat, but if you have questions, launch them out into the ether as well, and we will tackle them and we will make majesty and all will be good. Kalu Kale. Alrighty, I'm excited. Wow, that was a great introduction. Yeah, I don't know who you're talking about, but I'm ready to um, go. Yeah, so what I was interested in, and, and the thing that I, I I work on a lot is is this concept that you already brought up is, is how do you unpack expert knowledge? How do you help um, subject matter experts, faculty, to bring to consciousness that which they've spent years learning in order to become better educators? And I thought, contextually, that's great for me because by background in education, I'm not an instructional designer. I'm not a learning experience designer. I'd love to hear more about what distinguishes those two topics. How do you leverage your consciousness as an expert in this domain to help faculty come to consciousness um, with their curriculum? So I'll, I'll, I'll start. Dame Maggie Smith starting. <laughs> I have uh, kind of the the traditional role of instructional designer. I wouldn't say that what I do is that dissimilar from my colleagues, but um, the moniker that we currently use is the one that's been bantered about for the longest time. And um, there are some other terms that we all collectively use that and again, because I'm the word girl, I would posit that all of these could be changed and probably made better to get us closer to a, a perfect definition of truth. But uh, instructional designer works with subject matter expert or SME um, and maybe depending on the relationship works in equal partnership as instructional designer and faculty developer. And a lot of a lot of the challenge comes from the fact that we have, and particularly at a lot of research one institutions, we have um, faculty who are um, just so knowledgeable of the discipline, but not necessarily knowledgeable of how to convey it in the modality um, within which they've been asked to do so. So... Um, and I'm trying to think of a clever metaphor and I can't even think of one, which is, is fucking stupid. But, um, basically telling somebody that, um, who is a, a plumber <laughs> that they have to, to build the whole house that's around the plumbing in addition to doing the plumbing and not really giving them all of that education to, to do all of those pieces. So I'm, I'm training people on how to be architects and how to be engineers and how to be, contractors and, and doing all of doing all of those other pieces as part of my job. And I don't necessarily know if that was always the intention for the person to do all of those pieces, but we end up doing them because somewhere along the line, um, folks were not educated on, 
on how to build and construct within within this this unique environment. And I would be interested to hear what other folks have to say about their experience with working with SMEs because I actually don't mind that. I really like having that that close working relationship um, with with my faculty. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that helps to produce a fruitful and fulfilling class, even though technically it would be nice if folks were given a lot more of these tools before they were tasked with developing online courses. Well, I love the metaphor that you used of, of architecture. And, and I've often used that same one. And I've said to faculty that they are the client that has the vision for what they want this emerging expert, the, the learner, to look like, right? And they they have a vision for what they want all the pieces to look like. And the role of the instructional designer, and this is a question, is the role of, of the instructional designer as architect to help them to make sure that the structures are solid, that the pieces fit, and by the end of it, the the, the fuller, richer, more the more better version of that house that that client drew on a napkin is, is realized. Ben, what do you have to say on that? Um, I will give <clears throat> maybe a, a, a bit of an unpopular answer here. Um, but I, and I don't even know, I, I'm, we've given the kind of disclaimer before that we don't necessarily <laughs> represent or speak for our universities. Right. Um, Underline but in, that. <laughs> but in my work, I... I really stay away from subject matter expert or SME. I actually kind of cringe a little bit when I hear that acronym. Um, I do. I do too. By the way, because but I, I, I think of Smeagol and I think of Gollum, mm-hmm. and it makes me. <laughs> um, and only because I think at Ohio State, and I'm, I'm. This will sound probably haughty, but but I also like believe in this that like our faculty are not kind of reduced to subject matter experts. They're faculty who, you know, at their best, build relationships with students. They are uh, become invested in their lives. They're mentors. They help align internships. They they have this really robust role that at its, maybe at its best and worst, um, teaching is just kind of one piece of that or course delivery is just one piece of that, right? So on the, on the end where sometimes we get frustrated, we feel like, you know, particularly a lot of the structures around higher education at my institution anyway, reward faculty for doing things other than teaching, like maybe research. Um, and so teaching has this interesting place depending on who the faculty is. And so I, 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 as I listen to you, Frank, like unpack the question and Angela, as you answer, I, I don't mean to denigrate like subject matter expert or SME for lots and lots of folks. I just, I, I think when I do my best work and how I approach my role, I, I feel much more like a partner with faculty saying, where, where is it you want to go? What is the experience like when you're, what makes you fall in love with this subject? You, our lives are short, right? They're finite. What, what pushed you to dedicate your life to this as opposed to, uh, becoming a major league baseball player or, or working, um, you know, at, at an investment bank or whatever, you know, being a lawyer, whatever things you could have done, unless you're a, a law school professor and then we're having this conversation. Um, so I, I, I'm just really interested in the idea that, yes, I work beside you and with you and sometimes I'm up front pushing you. Uh, we, we try to have a little bit of a bat shop, I think, to do you need someone who's going to push you to produce work and online content. And, and then I think we try to be a little bit I think we've we've battled a little bit of the perception that online learning is inherently an inferior kind of learning or that yeah. hybrid is inherently inferior. And so I think a lot of the approach, um, the, the most resonant thing I will tell you, I'll, I'll wrap this up, is that uh, Andy Saldarelli and Amy Collier gave a presentation in New Orleans on soft infrastructure um, and how essentially their, their big keys for – working with faculty at Stanford to help kind of develop MOOCs were these these kind of four orientations that they wanted to promote um, intellectual and professional generosity. They wanted to promote exper- experimentation and risk-taking. They wanted to promote personal expression and, and healthy skepticism, right? They wanted faculty to have these perspectives or orientations and, and 
that's how they started to innovate. So I, the way I think about it, Frank, this is a total non-answer in that technical sense. But and you and I, I, I mean, I, this probably this answer probably doesn't surprise you based on previous conversations we've had. But I think I try to be responsive to what faculty, uh, kind of where they start in their orientation, and then I kind of just ask for permission of where I can push and pull and prod, and then I ask a lot of questions because I I. I think also adopting from the start the view of being a student. Um, I think that's the best use I have for for dealing with someone, uh, interacting with someone where I consider them a subject matter expert is to just presume I'm a student. I I just start trying to unpack as many questions as we work through things. So I want to pick at some of of this, and particularly I want to I want to pick at at terminology because I. I would posit that we're actually saying the same thing. And I mean, you and I know each other. Um, so you're familiar with, with what I do and, and I, you, but I, I think that the problem is language. I think that it's the, the term. So SME, well, SME being an ugly word. And yeah, I agree with you about the Schmeagel thing, but, um, subject matter expert makes it seem like we're going to faculty for a specific commodity, and that they're a commodity delivery system. And it's not a holistic experience where you're working with somebody in partnership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm particularly using that word because it's a, it's a troublesome one for me to use as well, being somebody that went to school for a good amount of time to, to do what I do, but still interact with um, faculty that don't believe that what I do is a science in any way. And um, yeah. it wouldn't be considered a partnership that I'm also and providing, I would... providing a commodity, which I actually don't have a problem with all the time if the product that comes out of it in the end is a great one for students. I don't I don't mind that at all. So if I am the architect and the house gets built, but the the person that um that actually ended up building the house thinks that I'm the janitor, I I don't really mind that as long as the house is still awesome. That's mm-hmm. so I will only push back and say I get really itchy around the idea that education is a commodity. Um, like oil and coffee beans, right, are the world's top two traded commodities, right? And so it's like I will tell you that I – maybe this is just who I am and I only buy – I mean I don't care about my oil, but I do care about my coffee beans. But like w- to push back on that analogy, there's you know there's a difference between you know an architect-crafted house and a, and a slew of kind of um, plywood, wood-framed condos that – that just get rented out, right? Like, I mean, I feel like the type of structure matters. And so, like, I don't the know. Structure, I think, the structure is going to be awesome. There's just going to be no plaque to Angela Gunder on the outside of it. Um, I, I would say maybe. I mean, when I think about that, right, I think about, like, lots and lots and lots of cheaply built condos that get sold expensively, right, when I think of, 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 the, of the idea of commodity. I think of – I think of – Lots of for-profit and technical schools that just dump content into an online place, but yet they've been done with instructional d- design, and they've they've. I mean, we've had people interview with us for who want positions who have come from those kinds of places, and their view of this stuff is very rote and mechanical, mm-hmm. and they take the view that as the instructional designer, they just need to go get the stuff from the faculty and then dump it into whatever the LMS is and align some objectives and do some, have a, some sort of logic model that justifies that. I, I guess that's, and that's, that's bad. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, <laughs> right. So I guess that's, but, but that's the thing is I, I, that's just my bent. And so that's, that's and, and I agree with you totally. That's not so really I, what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking more about what do you need to do in order to facilitate, um, production, and again, not an assembly line, but what do you do to facilitate production to make the folks, all of the the stakeholders that are part of it, do the best that they can possibly do? And sometimes it means subjugating yourself within that process. Sometimes it means, you know, taking a step back and making it seem like you are the servant in this whole situation. Oh, that's <laughs> That's a great oh, no, point. Mommy, how, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening to all this, and 
I agree with that last point right there. I guess maybe from my experience with learning experience design, looking at people not necessarily as these subject matter experts, but these pools of knowledge and experience and going to students and talking with them, seeing what the best ways for that they want to learn from these pools of knowledge and creating open and safe spaces to connect both the holder of the knowledge and then the seeker of the knowledge and creating like this almost like a flat educational hierarchy. Like taking, taking, taking a step back, right? Putting your, putting your ego out of the way and being like, I want to extend what I know and what I've done to help others learn for this, for this, for, to try to get where I am. Does, does that make sense? sense? I, I, I like what you guys are, are saying, Ben. I especially appreciate what you were saying about the more holistic experience of, of being um, a mentor. You, your faculty seem to extend beyond the classroom and act as a more holistic mentor to the students, and I applaud that. I don't know that that exists everywhere, but I, 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 I think that's why I've uh, resonated so much with the concept of the, the, the client and honoring that person, whether we call them a SME or anything else, uh, you know, a rose by any other name would smell sweet, right? And, and being a language teacher, I'm not so hung up on the exact word, although I understand that certain words have certain connotations. And we do often take this, this subject matter expert, shorten it, Using the language SME, it sounds ugly, so that we have a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that person as being an expert, someone we want to honor, our client. Um, But, Angela, I'm wondering about the concept of subjugating yourself to someone else rather than working in that strong partnership where both parties are honored. I know that I tend to be an idealist in that, but isn't it important for faculty to know that it to uh, to realize the fullest potential of this special thing that is not a commodity, and in fact, institutions distinguish themselves through their intellectual intellectual property, which is the curriculum. And the best way to do that is to have a community of practitioners that are all honored, and have that instructional designer be valued for their work. I, I do think that all of us, and not just instructional designers, but every single one of us should be valued for the contributions and the work that we that we do. I know that... Um, in and then ter- why is it so hard for faculty, and, and this is my personal construct of this reality, why is it often that faculty don't, as you said, um, believe that what you do is, is uh, potentially a science or valid or what have you? I don't think that they come in believing that it's a science or that it's valid. I think that some folks have to see it in action. And in order for them to stick around and watch the movie, sometimes you have to um, change the way in which it's presented. So you're not leading and beating somebody over the head with the fact that, yes, in the end, um, it will be an equal partnership. And yes, the work that this person is going to do for you is going to be outstanding if you are open enough to um, explore these ideas with them that you have. And um, I, I always say that um, I can tell individual people how to build an online course, um, but the course that they're going to build is one that's from my head, and it's not necessarily the best one that they could possibly build that's rooted in um, exemplary engaged learning in their particular discipline. So in order to get us to that point, um, sometimes it helps to sort of shy away from titles and let them know, and maybe subjugate is too strong of a word. It makes it seem like I'm a slave, and that's not at all the case, because a slave isn't honored for their work. But in actuality, it's... it's um, Humbling yourself to a a certain extent, but also um, letting people know that you are an unwavering form of support for them and that you're here to help them as they walk that path, as opposed to you and I are, are equally invested in the, in the path in the exact same way, which I would. I I think that's a great perspective. And is that the role of, um, a person in, in expert knowledge. I mean, that's the idealized version of the faculty, right? Is 
Absolutely. You're walking the path with the learner and you're facilitating their emerging mastery, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're way, way, way behind them on the path. And intentionally so. Sometimes you're, you know, you're just a, a beck and a call away. So say you've built a course and the faculty member is out there actually teaching the course that they've built. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily there day in and day out, but you're, you're, you're known to be there as a support if something comes up. Or, you know, what is really important to me is uh, scheduling time for a deep reflection after a faculty member has taught a course that we've developed for the first time. And it's not a procedural or a methodical process of saying, okay, what links broke? What were the things that we didn't get to in the timeline? Um, it's actually digging in and envisioning... More philosophical reflection. Versus- yeah. Uh, you know, did you feel that... Um, that you were giving students access to the real world skills that they would need in order to be considered uh, masters of the particular content that you presented in this course. And if it didn't happen, why didn't it happen? And sort of digging into that. And I have to tell you, you know, I've been in ID for a while, but I haven't um, led reflections that have been um, that philosophical in the past until uh, I want to say about a semester or two ago. And the first time I did it, it was profound and it was emotional because um, we had already gone through that journey of developing the course together. We had gone through the um, the process of them teaching the course for the first time. And of course, there's, you know, some technical um, hiccups once in a while. And there's the experience of just figuring out, okay, was all of this work worth it? And, you know, um, um, just just taking that step back from 30,000 feet and having the breathing room to say, how, how did this really feel? And did I really hit the mark? And did I do the job that I wanted to do? And when you, when you take that time to truly reflect on that, um, it is humbling in both directions for the ID and for the faculty member, especially knowing that both people in that room should care a hell of a lot about the student experience. And that's what those questions are really getting at. How successful were you in creating a meaningful and profound student experience? And I I, I don't think I would ever go back to doing a reflection that was, you know, more of like that link checking and that fact analysis of did we, um, you know, did we meet all of the check boxes? I really like the fact that you know, we're pushing back on, on even the good stuff. We're pushing back on it because there's always room for things to get better. And sometimes it's hard to live in that, in that space of, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but there's always that opportunity for progress and for improvement. And we have to live, we have to actively live in that space and keep on striving and doing it because our students fucking deserve, deserve every last bit of us doing that. That's, that's how we're going to create the best experience for them. I absolutely agree that it always it should always come down to optimizing student achievement and the experience. And and you've talked a couple of times about the the, the instructional design or, or, or learning experience design is a science. Tommy, can you talk a little bit about how would you recommend we formalize this process a little bit more? Because it seems that a lot of our work is um, at, at, in many ways informal or, or not structured. And so it's not, we're not replicating these successes sufficiently to scale. Yeah. So listening in, it's from, it's like taking the, from my experience, taking the methodologies of user experience and then applying it to learning experience of speaking with both reflection and being perspective, perspective with the uh, with the faculty, the teachers, and as well as the students, to see what, like, if it was a reflection, then how, what, what problems did they come into, right? What were, what were the expectations prior to the, the uh, first initiation of this formalized learning? But then, seeing moving forward, what, what were they hoping from then on? It's, on, it's like looking at what was already created, right? It's like looking. And seeing this, like you said, this type of informal learning. And I would say the informalness of it isn't a bad thing. But seeing how we can create structures to take advantage of both the formal 
the formal structure of universities and combining it with some informal learning spaces. And then Ben, may I ask, we, we were talking earlier about I- innovation. So is it possible for, for innovation to live in this, in this free-form space? Uh, or, or does innovation require a structure in order to iteratively improve the quality and optimize that learner satisfaction and achievement of the outcomes? I would say innovation ultimately comes out of the collaboration of the teacher and the students, of where, not, hmm, taking a quick, deeper thought, but that it's, it's like, um, one, one thing I usually say when it comes to systems is that some of the best systems I've seen are ones in which there is a immutable skeleton, but then it allows enough of uh, allows for the users, for both teachers and students, to mutate it in ways for their needs. Like one key example is you have Twitter, right? Twitter, you have a set structure of people posting things. And while, okay, sure, so you have 140 characters. However, how has it been able to be successful as a teaching and learning tool? Between direct between um, linking threads to hashtags, like hashtags is a big one right there, of having this system of hashtags. But then, I guess what I guess what I'm speaking of is at least teaching and learning on a larger scale of spreading that learning out and spreading that innovation by exposure, exposing as much of the past and existing knowledge and getting more more opinions and more perspectives into that. And that's where I see innovation comes from in learning. Great. Ben, what about your perspective on this? I would just definitely piggyback the idea that, that where did, where, you know, Steven Johnson wrote a whole book on it, right? Where do good ideas come from? Um, you know, I think I'd probably mention this guy every week in this, in this podcast, but I mean, Charles Duhigg's, you know, newest book, smarter, faster, better, um, writes a chapter on innovation. And again, the idea that innovation comes from kind of, you know, old ideas being repackaged in new ways and being cross pollinated in new ways. There was a really good, I just, I finally tweeted out this morning, but I read it yesterday. Um, MIT Sloan management review, uh, posted an article, um, or maybe it came out today, but new research suggests that, uh, People with a diverse Twitter network um, that kind of connects them with people that or exposes them to people and ideas they don't already know tend to generate better ideas. And so I think that just echoes kind of what Tommy's point is, right, that when you collaborate, when you – and and Angela, maybe to a larger point, the things that we've talked about before, right, or my – one of my big beliefs and um, it's just kind of one of those things like – I like to say, of course, I think I'm right about this. If I didn't, I would think some other thing, right? I would think some other thing that I thought was right. But in this particular area, you know, the idea that ed- what education does at its best, right, is it opens your world. It makes your world bigger and in turn puts more, more tools in your tool belt to, uh, to accomplish more things. Um, and so I think that idea that the kind of and not always good right in some ways for bad right the more you're exposed to that's that's not always good sometimes you learn things you didn't want to learn or you learn things you can't unlearn or um uh, it's not um all great but but i am taken by the idea and and i think tommy said it and i'm just gas bagging here but the idea that um (laughs) collaboration, particularly across disciplines, across people with different life experiences, um, is a um, good way to get us there. Uh, maybe the last thing I would say on that is in terms of you know, some talk around methodologies or systems. I mean, I think, you know, I think one of the things that I loved, particularly when we were in, at, at OLC Innovate and we were in the, uh, when we were in the innovation lab, around this design thinking methodology, right, is this is essentially a heuristic of the scientific method applied to (laughs) human problems. And so we work at these things, you know, when you define a challenge, right, you're in some ways you're 
you're putting limits on that. I don't suppose that they're arbitrary, but maybe they could be. And so in some ways, this is heuristic, right? We're working at this the best we know how, and yet we're working at it earnestly, collaboratively, and optimistically. And so I, I do think um, that idea of a method, right, where we're kind of working through that cycle. If, if, if this was 15 or 20 years ago and we were talking – uh, about total quality management, right? We might be talking about a PDSA cycle or something like that. And again, is some of this repackaged or regenerated? Maybe. Um, but that stuff feels like the way human beings tackle and approach things. So is innovation revolutionary or evolutionary? Well, because I didn't uh, fully mute my mic and I'm still talking. I, that's a really good question that I actually should shut up and, and think about a little more. Uh, I'm I'm prone to take what I don't think is an easy way out and say, I, I don't know. I think that's worth thinking about. I, Frank, let, you're asking all the questions, but I would be um, – where does that you can, question? You can ask Frank because I have well, a I have an well, idea of what he's probably going to say as an answer. So I want to hear what his answer well, is. Yeah, I guess I I will lead into that with tell me why you think your answer is your answer. I guess I'd say, um, do you ask that because one sounds obvious to you? Because that part of me just wonders um, why, depending on the context, it couldn't be either. Well, I I like to look at uh, so I'll give you what my answer would be, and I believe that it's evolutionary. Um, and this goes back to my background as a French teacher and, and, and looking at history. And, and when you revolutionize something for as many new things as you create, you're, you're often doomed to, to, to generate. For, for the positives you generate, you're almost doomed to generate negatives. And I, I don't like putting students at risk and, and, and exposing. I'm supposed to be, as, as a faculty, as an instructional designer, I'm supposed to engineer what we stipulate is the best learning experience. We're not going to be perfect at it, but that's why they were paying us the money that they're paying us is to help them to learn the most efficiently that they can. You would imagine that the best universities, the best institutions are doing that really, really well for the greatest breadth of, of learner types. So I, I, I don't want to throw at them this revolutionary idea that, that could put them at risk. I, I, I'm going to go back to some of the things that you said, Ben, and, and, you know, are these re, are are the concepts of instructional design repackaging of other engineering concepts? And I say they are. You know, we're, we've learned from other areas how to iteratively improve what what we're doing and improve instruction. So I know that as as outsiders look in in instructional design and education, they're not going to see what we might consider innovations. But as you work through the ins and outs daily of, of designing curricula, of engaging learners, we have these little sparks that we consider um, innovations. And these are the types of things that we'll present at conferences where, again, outsiders are going to think it's the most boring, mundane topic. But for us as insiders who have worked with it, see it as, wow, an amazing thing. The, the disruptive changes that we see wherever are, are those one in a million chance where you've absolutely discovered something amazing, but those aren't something that you could work towards. They, I think, often just happen. Well, I would, I would also posit that the moments that we feel like a revolution has occurred, that this spark of great action or activity or insight or you name it, um, is the culmination of a whole lot of evolution that happened before it. So like when people talk about, um, oh, this person made it overnight, and then they say, no, I've been you know, working on my career for how many years leading up to this. It's the same way with innovation. We just don't necessarily claim it or call it out, all of the work that has happened beforehand in order to, to make that, that big moment, that, that, um, that culminating event actually happen. That, that's, and that's my preference. I would rather know that there's a great deal of perspiration and a little tiny bit of inspiration that helped bring about that success because that has a lot of depth and meaning behind it versus, oops, I did something good. And, and that's the role of the subject matter expert or the faculty or the industri and, and instructional design or learning experience designer. There's something, there's, there is a methodology behind you that's helping to ensure that what you're doing is, is a good thing, right? 
why else would you hire an architect to help you build your house unless they had that expertise as well as the insight into your vision for what you wanted as a house, right? Yeah, and Frank, I like what you said earlier about iteration as well, because everything we conceive as innovation is just another step in the process, right? There's, there's no, I don't see that there's an endpoint to a lot of things we do. It's not the point where it's like, oh, okay, that's it. We can't ever go past and improve upon that. And when, it, when I also agree about innovation be evolutionary rather than revolutionary is because like, for, for example, why do we bring on new people? Right. Why do we bring on uh, subject matter experts is because we are hoping to tap into their knowledge to contribute, to remix a bunch of resources to continue to progress our goals forward. I, I love that. And that's really that that perspective. And, and I love whenever I have the opportunity to do it. I love bringing multiple faculty together as mm-hmm. diverse stakeholders representing the, the body of knowledge that they are experts in. And, and ask them these questions because, Ben, as you brought up earlier with the, the, the Twitter aspects, right, when you have experts in the same domain discussing and negotiating their constructed reality of the body of knowledge, you get a great, rich representation of that. That's right. And as the instructional designer, you're almost like an artist or, again, an engineer looking to, to take this 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 reality and, and, and make something uh, tangible out of it. And when you can take that tangible thing and scope and sequence it really, really well so that any novice being exposed to this can, can walk, begin to walk the path of those, those uh, subject matter experts, those faculty, those experts, and, and it begin to construct that same expert experience, I think that's what distinguishes a curriculum. And I think that's what we're here to do. Um, and that's why I, I, I so deeply honor the work that instructional designers do in engaging with faculty. And Ben, if what you guys are doing is, is moving outside of the construct of the, the structure of the house and also doing landscape architecture and creating <laughs> this holistic, rich... Digging a pool. <laughs> wow. That's, that's the epitome of what we should all be trying to do. I've I've long held the belief that um, courses that are designed by multiple faculty uh, members at the same time are the strongest courses in terms of the final product. And part of it is that that you talk about Frank when you say that they're coming together and there's this. Um, it's not even consensus, but it's a convergence of knowledge and. Um, it's the the process of negotiating meaning. It is the the process of, uh, and I'm going to pull from French, but finding le mot juste, the the perfect the perfect way to present these ideas for students. That that process is is difficult, and it's harder for the instructional designer to support that. But what results is a course that is representative of the many voices and perspectives that are out there in the real world, as opposed to just the distillation of one person's um, ideas and, and one voice. And the, the larger benefit is that the students realize, oh, there are multiple perspectives. There are many voices and there are, um, different ways in which this knowledge can be presented. This truth can be presented in multiple ways. Mm. And maybe there's room for me as just the student, just the student. I love that. Um, to present my own view within this landscape of truth. Absolutely. Learning is messy and knowledge is not, um, uh, knowledge is not, there is no one single piece of knowledge I think, and it's all about how we each construct that reality. And I think that's part of, of my perspective as, as a social constructivist is knowing that even as an expert, my expertise is incomplete and I can always learn from the diversity of those that I'm engaging in the discussion, right? I can learn from my students. And, and the most humbling experience is, is as an adult teacher, having a 12-year-old or 13-year-old student in class who calls you on a gap in your knowledge and you honor that learner by acknowledging it, that, that's a powerful thing. And that's led me to where I, I am today. 
So this is – thanks for that, Frank. This is – um, it's interesting. So one one thing that occurs to me it, is that it's it's entirely <laughs> possible – well, so I don't know how I've characterized maybe how I think about this or how I approach it because I, I agree with all – a lot of what we're saying going back to this kind of distinction. I I think maybe we are doing architecture and, and maybe not trying to do a landscape architecture or something like that. Um, and I think it certainly takes – I actually think maybe sometimes we we take too humble of a role. And so I I think it's maybe uh, – I don't really know where I'm going to that. I'm just, I'm just thinking about this and thinking – I probably didn't characterize some of what I said earlier, but I, there, there's some other thing I want to share. Uh, we'll let Dave probably make Dave edit all this out where I'm stuttering through. But I, I do think um, Dave is leaving every last bit of this in, by the way. I think there's something interesting, Frank, in, in what I hear you saying is innovation versus um well, I think of it like creativity versus a creative process, right? Those are two different things. And so I just want to read this this little bit of this passage from from this Duhigg book that I, I kind of referenced earlier. It says, we can create conditions that help creativity to flourish. We know, for example, that innovation becomes more likely when old ideas are mixed in new ways. We know the odds of success go up when brokers, people with fresh, different perspectives who have seen si- seen ideas in a variety of settings, draw on the diversity within their heads. We know that sometimes a little disturbance can help jolt us out of the ruts and even the most creative thinkers fall into as long as those shakeups are the right size. Uh, And he essentially says, be sensitive to your own experiences. Pay attention to how things make you think and feel. That's how we distinguish cliches from true insights. As Steve Jobs put it, the best designers are those who, quote, have thought about have thought more about their experiences than other people and recognize that. The panic and stress you feel as you try to create isn't a sign everything's falling apart. Rather, it's a condition that helps make us flexible enough to see something new. And And that's that's precisely what I think that the instructional designer does, isn't it? You've thought about these things. You don't know the the domain in which the the faculty is working, but you're helping to draw out of them that consciousness, right? Yeah, so I think – I think – I mean – one of the ideas here that I think where we're leaning toward, and it may be a, a, a conversation of like what could be next, and I think one of those things could absolutely be more and more and more kinds of cross-curricular classes and programs that build new kinds of knowledge, right? So I think that's one of the things I wonder for our faculty, is there this – let me ask maybe – well – I, sometimes I just wonder, do they feel like maybe they get in a rut of their focus and it's what they see and it's the silo. We talk a lot in higher ed about this siloed issue. Do you think this idea of maybe and, – and I guess the question for you, Tommy, is this what you think you all are up to at MSU in this hub is actually spurring innovation by bringing these faculty to, together in a way that might create something that, that gets them unstuck yeah, or jolts them? To, I guess to answer this, I want to pull from uh, my current undergraduate program, Experience Architecture. So, like, w- what exactly does it mean to be a user experience architect, right? That, that's not exactly a title that we go out to just seek. There's no specific. You, you don't you don't go and it's like, oh, I know exactly what this this and this is. Same as maybe it's like uh, learning experience design. What exactly does that mean? So how and this is what we're currently working towards developing and trying to find this system is. How this program is structured is trying to make students essentially a jack of all trades within within the curriculum of we uh, it's short for XA experience architecture is we give them classes in college engineering some programming classes to get them exposed to algorithmic thinking. We also get them exposed to uh, some philosophy classes to uh, to get their rhetoric skills up and their logic skills up, logic and reasoning, and then design classes as well, whether that be studio art to get their creative juices flowing, et cetera, et cetera, and, techni- and technical writing. But then that specific formula doesn't work with every student, right? So what we've been, what we've been uh, working towards at MSU and also like working with the hub in this as well is that allowing the students almost to choose their own path of where they want to go and then 
by but although by giving them all this exposure to different fields, different industries, then they're be, uh, sorry, bleh, they're better able to decide where they want to go, and then as a group between both the faculty and the students, better create a program that tailors to both the students and faculty and what everybody's goals are. I, I think, Tommy, that that's a great point. And, and the, the best faculty that I've ever seen are the ones who relinquish control and shift the locus of control to the learners so that the learners are able to best engage in, in mastering or, or coming to mastery the, the subject matter um, and engaging the faculty and, and, and staying fresh and involved in the content. So if you all as experts in designing these experiences can help faculty to do that, I think that that's an amazing thing. And that is the epitome of, of what I think we should be doing, helping to, to keep faculty um, moving forward in their consciousness and, and, and systematically helping learners to come to the, the, the consciousness that we need them to reach as part of the curriculum uh, and, and their area of study. Hear, hear. I don't think anything better is going to be said tonight. I'm just going to okay. I'm going to take that in. I, I, I like where we're at. Um, it was like stunned, stunned no, silence. No, it's, <laughs> it, is, it is. But um, as we we are uh, drawing near to a close, but I'd, I'd say, Frank, do you is there any last question you, you could pose to us that we might be able to just kind of popcorn around and give a one sentence or, or, or two sentence <laughs> answer to that? That that you'd like to either pick our brains or or challenge us with. Um, I, I I the things that keep coming into my mind are around how or where do you think your expertise will help subject matter experts, faculty to emerge in theirs. What what is your next thing as as a as a subject matter expert in um, exposing um, or, or bringing to consciousness the the work of, of faculty. Mm. Well, What's I'll the defer. next big thing in instructional design or learning experience design? Yes, I, so this came to my head, so I guess I'll, I'll start off. But one thing we could be, one thing we could do now is to help each other in our respective fields and respective uh, specialties and expertises is to help each other see the world through one another's eyes, through their perspective. For like, if one person has, if one subject matter expert teaches a particular way or sees the world through this way, how can they share that and get other people in their shoes? And by having those type of conversations, we can begin to, I guess, break down some of the walls that we have constructed that we want to like hold on to our ego. Mm. Bravo. I, I would second that. I think empathy is the, the pathway by which we're going to accomplish everything that we want to, to make a reality. Um, I think it will be interesting to pose really good questions, become – I think that empathy to, to cue in on really good questions and, and challenge faculty on their assumptions about what we do and maybe what we shouldn't do or maybe what we don't need to do anymore. So when I think about things like our global capacity to connect with others or to produce learning that extends far beyond the classroom and, and has a – a social, an economic, a political impact, tangible, right? As a student, right? That we flip this notion on the head that I'm just in this class contained. How, how do we poke and prod and challenge um, our faculty to, to reconceptualize even the role of, of what we're up to with this whole enterprise? I think I'm fascinated with that idea. Frank, what do you think? Uh, I wasn't prepared to answer, so I, I think I will say bravo to each of you as experts whom I honor. I think uh, I wish I had the capacity to do what you do, um, but I think it's a really important uh, partnership that, that learning experience designers, instructional designers, and the consciousness that you bring to faculty, it's, it's an amazing, important part of uh, online teaching and learning, face-to-face uh, -face learning, and I'd like to see it extend to more areas. So thank you all for, for sharing your expertise with me tonight. Well, thank you for, for moderating, and, and I would love to tell you that it's going to be that easy, but I'm sorry, it's probably not. You're, you're probably putting toes into 
not uh, a swimming pool, probably into some quicksand. And so we're probably going to going to rope you into some more of this but uh and tommy thank you so much for joining us i think i think we i don't know we haven't talked about this i don't know what's hard and fast or what we want to do but community and sharp people and uh, sending love out in the universe i think i speak for dave when i'd say that's what we're all about angela i think i think that sounds about right to you if you had a webcam on me i'd be making a big heart right now oh and for thank my you so much sake, for inviting me yeah, no. Thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, but I think uh, as we as we part for this week, um, I'm, at this point, I don't think we have regularly scheduled programming, so we can't promise you anything, um, in, including the fact that Dave Goodrich may <laughs> he might not be <laughs> he might not be safe out there. We might never talk to that cat again. But um, you know uh, what? If he is on a lifeboat with a tiger right now. I'm betting on Ranger Davy. Hey, that's that's how we do it. But for for Tommy, Frank, and Angela, this is this is Ben signing off for the uh, Innovation uh, Lab Cast for this week. Cheers! Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye.